was trying to talk. Hey, good morning. Welcome. Can you guys stand with us? We're going to begin with our worship. Holy Spirit, you're so welcome in this place, God. We just, we bring our hearts, God. We bring our minds, Father. We put our attention on you this morning. King Jesus, we put you in the highest place. Have your way.
said to us is born this man Emmanuel for unto us has come freedom from the gates of hell you rescue you pardon every dead You bind up all the broken Your mercy is stronger, yeah Your love is limitless If grace is like the sea I'm drowning in your death We can't be It is in heaven be near God be near Your presence here As it is in heaven Oh my soul Rejoice A thrill of hope is called And every fear destroyed The Savior of the world is born. You rescue every prisoner You pardon every death You bind up all the broken Mercy stronger yet Your love is limitless If grace is like the sea I'm drowning in your death Oh God be near God be near Your presence is here As it is
oh, when we just say more, we're not actually getting actually more of him because we have all of him. It's all available all the time. We're just saying, God, I feel like I don't have all of you, even though I really do. So your mind is playing tricks on you. Your soul is playing tricks on you. There's things feeding alternate kingdom in your life. And we have to lay those alternate kingdom things down at the cross. And this morning when we come together to worship, we're laying those things that are alternate to the kingdom of God at the cross this morning in worship. And when we sing, I need you more right now, to me that means I'm not there yet, Jesus. I need that reality of who you are to be so much more real in my life, in my mind, in my everyday life. So would you lay those things at the cross that would pull your attention away from the kingdom of God, which is so perfect, and calling you in closer, and calling you into presence, calling you into peace, joy, love. Would you lay those things down that are, that are pulling you away from those things this morning?
here, come on, just lift your voice. Come on, there's no one like him. All around this room, just make a choice. Just make a choice. Come busting through his gates with thanksgiving in your heart, his courts with praise. It comes with a sound. It comes with a sound. Even you, even in the midst of your circumstance, you can lift a sound in this place. Come on, men. Come on, men, all around this room. Come on. Come on, it's a time, this is a season when kings go out to war. And we war with the sound. We war with the sound of praise. We war with the sound of worship. I don't want to be the loudest guy in the room. Hey, said at a corner, that I said, can you know I'm going to say? It's not too hard. You were made for this. You were made for this. You were made for this sound. You were made for glory. You were made for connection with this one that we call Jesus. It's his name, Yeshua, the Son of the Living One. There's no one like you. Yes, Spring up a well, spring up a well, spring up a well. Oh, within my soul, bless the Lord, oh my soul, and all that is within me. Bless, blessing, oh, let the blessing rise. Don't become weary, don't become distracted. Oh, just turn your heart to Him right now. Just turn your heart to Him right now. Oh, your breakthrough happened 2,000 years ago. Step in, step in, step in, step in. thousand years ago Jesus made a decision to endure the cross for the joy set before him to set the example to be the breakthrough you want breakthrough look to the cross he said it is finished in the face of what we would perceive to be the greatest injustice. He said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. 
And he looked to the thief that was hanging on a cross to the side of him and he said, this day you will be with me in paradise. This is the God that we celebrate. This is the one who is worthy of the sound that's in your belly right now. The King of glory, the bright and morning star, the lamb that was slain from the foundations of the earth. He's outside of our culture. He's outside of our ideas of what is decent and orderly. He is the King of glory. He's the God of your circumstance. He is seated high above all principalities and powers. There's no one like him. He's Jesus. He's Jesus. Do you need another name? He's Jesus. He's Jesus. Oh, I can go all Hebrew and say, Oh, it's Yeshua, the anointed one. But he's Jesus, and he's my Jesus. And I am his, and he is mine. This isn't hype, this is passion. Because I've been touched by the one who loved me first. I don't care what the world says, it, how church should act. I know the sound that he desires because I know the sound that he releases and he's the lion of the tribe of Judah and he roars over his church today with passion and with fire and with justice with healing with grace and mercies that are new every, every morning and, and a love that endures forever and the power of his cross is enough for you. So Holy Spirit, I ask that you would come. Lord, I appreciate free will, but would you just overthrow me today? Lord, would you search us and know us and see if there's anything in us that would inhibit the free flow of your glory and grace. Anything that would inhibit the release of that river of life that you put in us, God. Anything that would in inhibit us from walking in the fullness of who you have already said that we are. And by the power of the cross, drawn by your goodness, we turn to you and we say, yes, Jesus. Yes, Jesus. I turn from my way, I turn to your way. I say yes to you, Jesus. I don't know what the mission is, but man, your goodness is so much greater. And remove all of those blockages right now, right now, by the power of your word, by the power of the cross, the power of your blood, Jesus. Remove, transform from glory to glory in this moment, right here, right now, God. We turn to you, we turn to you, we turn to you, God. We release forgiveness toward those who have wronged us, God. We bring reconciliation in our hearts for those that have caused division. Grace, grace, grace to the mountains in our lives. I shout grace, grace, grace to the mountains in our lives. I shout grace, grace, grace to the mountains. And the stone rolls away. And resurrection power comes alive in our hearts again. And that same spirit that raised Christ from the dead quickens even our mortal body. This is the beauty of communion. The power of the name of Jesus. The glory of the Lamb who now sits on a throne. God be near. And so we invite you to come to the table and receive the elements of communion and you can take them back to where you want to be we're, we're going to receive together in just a moment but come we're not bringing it to you you got to want it you got to come and get it so come and get some jesus and we'll receive together in just a moment You come back and you call it 
my victory. took the bread and he said this is my body broken for you he took the cup and he said this is my blood poured out for you do this remember me he just said remember this moment don't forget the power of the cross don't forget what I endured for the joy set before me don't forget the example that I set for you that I gave it all up for the world I gave it all up for those around me, those within my sphere of influence. Well, he happens to be the king of glory, so that's the entire universe. So remember my example and go therefore and do likewise. Give it up. Give it up. Give it up. So in the presence of men and angels and before your throne, we honor you, King Jesus, and we eat and drink for the honor of the King. Eat and drink, church. Come on.
Jesus. We're in this season that we call Advent. It's a beautiful time. You guys can be seated, but we just want to devote ourselves to the public reading of Scripture. So if our Adventy people could come forward today, not, not you. Come on now. Your hair looks great today. I could use some of that hair on my head. We do a follicular transplant. Your hair looks good too, but how's it going? I heard you were like nervous about reading. You gonna read it all today? Really? Not at all. She's gonna read. She got she's gonna read. She's gonna read the first part. Do you guys welcome these guys? Come on. <clears throat> We're going to be reading from Isaiah 9, 2, and 6 through 7. Um, so, the people we walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwell in a land of deep darkness on them has light shone. For us, for to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder. And his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government, um, of the peace, there will be no end on the throne of, of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to upon it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. Luke 2, 8 through 14. And in the same region, there were shepherds out in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the lone Lord shone around them. And they were filled with great fear. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. So now we're going to light the fire again. It's a lighter. Oh, come on. Like that. Yeah, you gotta, you gotta be, you gotta be just violent and forceful. You gotta flick it. See, she's so pure; she didn't know how to use a lighter. Here, I, I, I got it. I hope I'm doing this in the right order. Oh, it's that one. Okay, see, she knows. Amen. Give these guys a hand. Yeah, you're good. I think I think that's it. Matthias, would you come on up? I'm not. <laughs> good morning. If the ushers could come forward, that'd be awesome. So if it's your first time here doing family, we'll, we'll welcome you here. Thank you for choosing to do family with us. Uh, we just had an awesome time last night. And so um, a while back, I was telling you how when I found two dimes, God said there's a 10-time ten, ten multiplication coming. And then I found $10 just blowing in front of me. The week after that, I found two $10 scratch tickets, not scratched, that just blew in front of me. And this week, a customer gave me a $250. Um, so, so when we pray for unknown money sources, it's a real thing. <laughs> it is a real thing that we pray for. And I completely believe it, and I know God is faithful and just. So if you want to partake in the offering, you're more than welcome to. 
But if it's your first time here, if you could fill out the Connect card and put a prayer request in there, if you have one, and put it in the offering envelope, that'd be awesome. If you would like to give, you can uh, do debit or credit card two ways. You can text the word Bridge Metro West to 77977, or you can download the Bridge app and it will give you a link to push pay. If you want to pay by check, you can pay by uh, writing the check out to the bridge. And uh, cash always works, but I, not so many people use cash as much anymore. And so um, with that being said, I'm just going to pray and we're going to put faith to what we do. So, Father, once again, we ask that you show who your sons and daughters are in this place, in this time, in this region. We ask for jobs. We ask for marketplace favor. We ask for promotions and advancements to come forth. We ask for entrepreneurs to rise up with inventions, creative services, and solutions. We ask for supernatural debt cancellation to take place. We ask for unknown money to come forth. Unknown income streams to come forth. Hmm. In Jesus' name. Father, we ask most of all that you teach us how to steward what you put in our hand. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Pastor Greta. <laughs> Up from the grave I arose. Oh, man. Hello, welcome visitors. Paul will often, you know, joke in the sermons, there's no one, like, there's someone weirder than you, so, like, don't worry about it. I'm, like, the weird one today, but um, the presence of God is, like, piercing me in a way. He's helping me to just fall in love with him all over again in the wonder of Advent that he came for us, and so... I'm an ugly crier. <laughs> I don't cry pretty, but um, it's because of his presence, and it's okay. So if you're laughing, that's awesome. If you got some tears, you know you're in good company. Come find me. Um, God is awesome today. Can I get an amen? He's awesome. Awesome, awesome, awesome. I want to thank um, and ask those of you who were here yesterday for Serenity House Christmas Party. Would you stand up if you helped set up, helped serve, helped did prophetic teams, helped clean up any of those things, gave a message? Yeah! A big dog in the house did it. Yeah, please, come on! Praise Jesus! Ho! Ho! That's awesome. You can be seated. I just wanted to honor you, Craig and Shelly. You were, you know, Jesus with skin on, and you led us so well in just reaching out to women that God loves dearly. And uh, we saw salvations, and people got rocked by the prophetic, and I trust, yeah, and healing, and I trust that um, the women really enjoyed the gifts that were given to them, too, and they are our gift to us. So, well done. I just wanted to acknowledge you. Uh, today, Elijah House Prayer Ministry, right after service, you're welcome to sign up. Just know that it's going to uh, be about an hour uh, because it's in-depth prayer ministry. Like often when we're up front, we pray for people and it's kind of a, you know, short five, ten minutes maybe kind of prayer. But Elijah House goes a little deeper and it's looking to do healing of the issues of the soul, things that just need a little bit more time. So if you're feeling a little stuck, in some ways, we invite you to go and sign up with Cindy right by the prayer room, right after service, first come, first served. Uh, this week coming up, we've also got prayer for our adult children. That's led by Jean Haig and Amy Coglazier. And so they'll meet you at 1130 this Wednesday, right in the prayer room women's Christmas tea this Saturday. We're so thankful. Missy O'Dell um, invites all the women, you know, regardless of your age, there's child care available. We ask that you bring uh, your favorite Christmas dish to share. It'll just be family, just the women of the house, just getting together. It's always awesome. So please come. It's this Saturday at 10. Uh, next Sunday, the 16th, we're doing uh, prophetic and dream teams. We usually do them on the fourth Sunday, but it'll be this third Sunday on the 16th. And in 
so we'll have dream and prophetic teams right here. But at one o'clock, Stephanie Wilkins and some of her team are going over to the mall. So if you want to do prophetic evangelism with people that are looking for Jesus in all the wrong places, <laughs> why don't you go um, connect with her? Steph Wilkins. Steph, are you still in the room right now? She was here earlier. She might be in the back. Oh, she's getting ready for that. Okay. Anyway, she's awesome, and so go connect in with her. And she does ask that you RSVP, so I left her email in the bulletin. If you would do that, that would be awesome. Uh, Christmas Eve is advancing. It's going to be uh, Monday night, of course, Christmas Eve the 24th, right here at 6 o'clock, and it's always um, family-friendly. So you want to get here and do that. Whew, have I got everything? I hope so. I think so, yeah. Wow, the presence of God is awesome. The presence of God is awesome. And even as God's doing a profound work here, we want to just take a moment as a family, if you could. I'm just going to lead a very short prayer, and then we'll get our kids released to classes. But many of you know Paul Nowell has had surgery this week, removing a cancerous mass in his throat. And so he's at Tufts Medical Center. We'll be there this week recovering, and then we'll have a season of some uh, physical therapy. But I know Diane and Paul both, their blessings to this house, and I know they appreciate your prayers. So we just say, God, before men and angels, we ask Jesus that you would come, Holy Spirit, and invade that room right now, that you would come into that hospital room, that there would be purpose, even in the midst of this suffering, God, and that you would do the extraordinary. We ask for accelerated healing. We ask that every cancerous cell would be gone. We demand that to go in Jesus' name. They got it all, but Lord, we just thank you for the surgery itself that went well with no complications but God we ask that there would be justice restored to this man that his voice would be restored to him Lord this is not naturally possible but in you all things are possible and so we declare God your goodness upon that man's life we declare your shalom to be in that hospital room right now and that you'd bring your strength and your grace and your peace and your wellness into that family. We bless them in Jesus' name. All right, so keep them in your prayers. Reach out to them. I'm assuming Diane is probably going to be at the hospital most of the week, so if she's not picking up the phone, you'll know why. All right, well, it's awesome. Youth, you did awesome for your Advent reading. Thank you for just stepping up and doing that. We love you. We love who you are becoming. And we love our kids. So kids, why don't you rise to your feet? We'll just re pray over you as you get ready to go to your classes. Parents, you should already be back. I mean, teachers, you should already be back. And parents, you're going to help get your kids into check-ins. So, all right. Over every child right now, we declare your goodness, God. I thank you, Lord, for these beautiful young boys and girls. And they're growing up healthy and strong. They're growing up knowing that they are loved by you and they have purpose, that there is real purpose for their being. And God, I thank you. I ask right now that you would come and saturate the classrooms with your presence in such a way that they would know you, that they would know who they are becoming. I ask for mighty signs and wonders to break out. I thank you for the gift of prophecy that our kids are experiencing. I thank you for the healings that they walk in. I thank you for the words of knowledge that they get. Lord, we say, do more. Go, Jesus, in those classrooms. Do more. Do it again. Bless the teachers, and everyone said, amen. amen. Okay, kids, you're checked out. Go check in. All right, Paul, come on up. And why not all the rest of you um, who are in the sanctuary, why don't you just stand to your feet? Yeah, 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 yeah. Lord, I pray that you would invade this house right now with even more of the wonder of your being, the wonder of your presence. And I pray, Lord, let, just stretch out your hands right now for the more. Yeah. 
stretch out your hands for the more. God, we encountered you in the, the time of communion. We encountered you in the worship. We encountered you, Lord, in the Advent reading. But God, there is a message you want to drop into this house right now. There are words of fire that are going to break open healing and hope. And so I ask God right now that you would prepare our hearts for the word. Lord, we bless this man of God who has been faithful to pursue you and we are the beneficiaries of that that life that's been poured out for you God so Lord bring it in the word we pray in Jesus name amen, amen. all right you can be seated <laughs> bring, it. bring it I'm gonna trade Bibles I brought my my brown Bible up but I, I need my black preacher's Bible might have to hit some people with it. No. In love. I, I texted a friend this morning and said, hey, I'm not feeling 100% today, but I'm still going to bring it. Why? Because that's what we do. That's what we do. We had an amazing day yesterday uh, with Serenity House, and it's, it's truly one of my favorite things to do. If you've never been a part um, uh, of one of those Christmas shindigs, of course, you have to wait a year. You know, maybe we'll do like a Christmas in July party. I've always wanted to do one, you know, like a Christmas in July party. And it could be like a whole church thing. And I'm not declaring thus and so, but, you know, I don't even know what's happening in July. Uh, I know it's not happening. It's not going to be in the teens when you wake up in the morning. <laughs> not here anyway. So um, it, it was truly amazing. We, 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 uh, saw a number of salvations. I'm not, I'm not one to count, you know, but there was a bunch of hands that went up and I was in the back and we had to, we had to leave early. Usually I stay for the, the whole event, but you know, we just had things kind of stacked up and, uh, I, you know, I did kind of walk through some kind of a weird virus cold thing that does not belong in this body this week. Um, so I gauged my week really around Serenity House. I wanted to make sure that I had, you know, that I was good for that. You know, and so I canceled some meetings and this and that, but um, but we did have to to leave. Um, you know, as it transitioned in the prophetic teams and all that kind of stuff. And this, uh, I sat at one of the tables, and and this girl looked at me and she goes, "Can I talk to you?" And I was, of course. And she said, "Um, you know, I've been an atheist, and you know, I used to make fun of people like you." And I said, "That's okay. I make fun of people like me." <laughs> I mean, all the time. I mean, sometimes people get upset because I, I mean, but, it, you know, it's just I got to amuse myself. It's all right. Of course, Amy Thompson was sitting at the table sit there, and she said, I, I make fun of people like us, too. So, And, and she said, but I, I've been jealous of the girls in the house who have faith. Today, I, I, I think I met them. You probably heard me blubbering, she said. I, I don't I don't hear I don't I'm like in some weird zone when I speak or when I you know, I don't I don't know a lot of what's going on individually, but um this is what we do. This is what we do. We sow seeds, we we release presents, you know. We're literally on a mission to leave the imprint of the Father's heart on every person that we come into contact with. That's what we do. Come on. No golf claps in the bridge. So, Michael, throw up that that mission statement. We, we've we been talking about mission, vision, and values. We took a little hiatus uh, last week to let Ken Fish come and play with our people. And that was an awesome weekend. But we're going to pull this whole thing together. It's a great Christmas message. Be, because Jesus came and gave us a mission. So... And, you know, if, if that's not enough for you, we got a tree right there. I'm not afraid of trees. I'm not afraid of Santa. I'm not afraid of, you know, bunnies and whatever else. You know, just, uh, you know, you know what I love about the Christmas season is that people get saved every year during Christmas. I don't know about all the other, you know, well, whatever. Right? We don't need to go there. Let's start getting snarky. Our mission. 
is to leave the imprint of the Father's heart on every person we meet. Okay, I think what we need to do is we need to release a declaration to the atmosphere just so that this room knows what we're here to do. So let's all read this together. All right, ready? Our mission is to leave the imprint of the Father's heart on every person we meet. You, you are equipped with a firebrand. If you are in Christ Jesus, he has given you everything you need. His divine power has already given you everything you need for life and godliness according to your knowledge in him. I don't care what your physical condition is. I don't care what your heart condition is. I don't care what your mental condition is. In your weakness, his power is perfected in that space. If, if in the, before the cross, God could prophesy through a donkey, it's in the Bible, he can speak through you. I choose my words carefully. I want to go King James on you with that passage, but, but we web stream now, so I, I won't. But let's go a little bit deeper with this. What makes us unique? Well, I mean... What doesn't make us unique? <laughs> Having said that, why don't you give uh, Greta and, and, and Matthias a hand this morning? They did a great job. <laughs> Holding it together. You know, Greta just is like a, she's like a lightning rod for the spirit sometimes, and it makes me a little nervous in the context of a service, but it's always good. She, she's awesome. But when we talk about the one thing, man, when people walk in the door, there's one thing that we hear consistently. Even, you know, in the context of Serenity House, I'm sitting and talking to a couple of the girls yesterday, and they said, I felt his presence. Amen. We want to release encounter. Like, I, I'm, not here, I'm not here to put little check marks or, you know, notches on my belt for how many decisions for Christ we get. I, I'm here to bring you to a point of decision. And that doesn't stop when you say yes to Jesus. Every time you show up, every time you experience his presence, he brings you to a point of decision. And you've got to decide, are you going to say yes? Or are you going to stay in your mess? You can say yes in the mess. There's so much, oh man... You know what? There's so there's just so much talk about breakthrough. I, you know what? I love breakthrough. I could preach breakthrough messages all day long and hoot and holler. And we all get excited and yeah, woo, breakthrough. And I, everybody, you know, shout out to God with a voice of triumph. We could do that. But the reality is breakthrough happened 2,000 years ago. You know what breakthrough? Let me tell you what breakthrough. This is not my notes. Sorry, Mike. Just 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 hang on. Put the encounter thing up, Mike and or Jeremy, whoever's back. I don't know who's back. I just see a top of a head. Turn to Psalm 23. You could do that too. Let me tell you what breakthrough looks like. Because I think, you know, we're, 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 well, you know, God is good. And all the time. I'm just, I'm just, I'm going to read the, I'm going to read some of this. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He restores my soul. He guides me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake, by the way. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil for you are with me. What does breakthrough really look like? Even though you're in the valley of the shadow of death, you fear no evil. Why? Because he is with you. It doesn't say when you're in the valley of the shadow of death, he's going to come and take you by the hand and pull you out of that thing. What it says is, I'm not going to fear any evil. Oh, there's a shadow. Oh, my goodness. It's death. Oh, I'm in a valley. I'm not, in, I'm not by the river anymore. I'm in a dark place. I'm in a difficult situation. But I look all of a sudden. I, I'm all closed in. I don't know what's going on. And I look to my right. And it's, oh, it's Jesus. Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I don't fear any evil. He doesn't necessarily take me out of my circumstance, but he gives me new perspective in that circumstance. And now all of a sudden, in the midst of my difficulty, I'm walking in a spirit of breakthrough because God is with me. 
that's breakthrough. Guess when you got it? 2,000 years ago when the lamb who was slain from the foundations of the earth hung on a cross and he said, it is finished. Anyway, encounter that. There's too many of us trying to get out of stuff that we let ourselves into. How you doing, brother? Oh, brother, I'm in the wilderness. I just want to get out of the wilderness. You know, well, the prophet Isaiah said that a voice cries out from the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. Maybe he led a whole group of people into the wilderness so that a group of people would start making straight the paths for the coming of the spirit of the Lord, the spirit of burning, the spirit of revival. Who we're so busy trying to get us ourselves out of the place that he, he put us into. We become nearsighted and blind. But at the beginning, it says his divine power has given you everything you need for life and godliness. So now add to your faith. Second Peter 1 3. Read it. It's a good passage. Encounter. Our mission is to demonstrate the love of Jesus, the power of Holy Spirit. And to leave the imprint of the Father's heart on everyone we meet until people, communities, cities, regions, and nations enjoy and reflect the fruit of the Spirit, beginning with love, joy, and peace. That's the deeper thought. You can break it down to, you know what, every situation that you're in, I want to leave the imprint of the Father's heart. Everywhere that I go, I'm declaring that the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The worship team in the middle, one of the songs, they started declaring on earth as it is in heaven. Declare that thing. Why? Because, well, Jesus prayed it. I think the king is going to have his way. There's a a deeper purpose for the imprint. First of all, this imprint that you place on the hearts of people that you come in contact with, it doesn't go away that easy. Because the instrument that God has placed in your hand by the word of the Lord is more substantive than anything else this world can offer. It doesn't mean that we're called to close deals. We're not peddling religion. But we're bringing people to a point of decision. See, his word says, in the book of Romans, it says this, kindness leads us to repentance. In history, there was a bunch of guys that decided to translate the Old Testament into Greek, and they used that word kindness, that Greek word, to correlate with the Old Testament word tov, goodness. The goodness of God leads us to repentance. We're to be the conduits and the displayers of the goodness of God. And when you do that, you lead people to repentance. It's going to happen. You bring them to the point of decision. You show them Jesus. And when we do that, as we step into the swirl of who he is, and he begins to awaken dreams in our hearts and our minds, and we begin to, to realize, oh my goodness, he's called us to disciple nations. He's not just called us to come to church on a Sunday morning. He's, he's called us to bring the kingdom everywhere that we go. What, is that, what does that look like? Well, it begins with love, joy, and peace. Sometimes people will say, well, what about the rest of the fruit of the Spirit? Well, the rest of the fruit of the Spirit doesn't really matter unless you start with love, joy, and peace. I, I've met people who are gentle, but don't have love, joy, and peace. Maybe you could be patient without love, joy, and peace. That might be difficult long-suffering. You know, I, all I know is that love, joy, and peace 
is there at the beginning. It's the first foretaste for the reason. And, and, and as you drink the one fruit of the Spirit, as you taste of the one fruit of the Spirit, that first foretaste is love, joy, and peace. And as it rolls back on your tongue, then you get all the other characteristics. And so we have a, a structure that we believe God has given us that allows us and enables us to make decisions in how we operate. It's what we value. You know, we value a lot of things. We value worship, and we value the presence, and we value people, but, but those values don't necessarily give us a flow through which we can operate. It's, it's there are things that we do. But it, they aren't values that become the, the river through which we can operate efficiently for the kingdom. And so these values are ranked. What does that mean? That just means that there's a supreme value. And then there's a number two value that's under the supreme value. And while we value that, it can't violate the ultimate value. So let's talk about how that works. Now, if you've been here the last month or so, you, we, we've talked about all of these things. We're just going to pull it all together this morning. So number one is love. We love God. We love each other. Mostly. Love is a decision and an emotion. But 1 Corinthians 13, 13 says this, But now faith, hope, love, abide, these three... But the greatest of these is, the greatest of these is, these abide. Faith, hope, it's not hope like, like <laughs> buying a scratch ticket. Or finding one on the ground and hoping that it's good. It's not like buying a lottery ticket and you just, oh, I hope I win this one. You know, they always say, you know, they put they, when those the, the big jackpots happen and the, the statisticians come out and they're like, you have more chance of being struck by lightning three times and then your carcass being eaten by a shark on dry land than you do uh, <laughs> of winning the lottery. But the, the reality, like, how, like, when has that happened? I know. I mean, come on. I mean, every month somebody. I'm not. Well, now I'm not encouraging you to go buy a lottery ticket. Now I'm just saying it's kind of weird how how statistics work. I've never actually heard a statistician say that, but that's what it feels like sometimes. And maybe more people get struck by lightning than I realize. I know it happens, but my I, my, my wife got sort of struck by lightning one time. That explains a lot. Why she's so amazing and beautiful awesome she's indestructible that's actually not that's not not far from the truth I would not get in a physical altercation with my wife because I would lose she's strong good Polish stock but now faith hope and love abide these three but the greatest of these is love love abides love abides love abides it remains the King James says I believe it's King James other translations. It abides. It remains. Love. It's the supreme value. Mark 12 30 says this, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. Don't throw your brain away. You can love God with your mind. That's why he put smart people on the earth. We need smart people to be smart. Don't tell them to shut their brains off so they can receive more of the Lord. I mean, sometimes you got to do that because your brain does get in the way. Sometimes your heart gets in the way. Sometimes your soul gets in the way. But here's what I do know. The Word says, love the Lord your God with all of your mind. So start using it. And with all your strength. Don't be a lazy worshiper. And some people, you know, I got, I got friends. I mean, I got friends all over the place. You know, people that love me, people that tolerate me. I've got, in some ways, I've got more favor with kind of cessationist Baptist and, you know, Presbyterian pastors than I do crazy other charismatic pastors. Because they'll send me all their problems that are outside the construct of their doctrine. <laughs> it's like, I don't really, I don't really believe a Christian can be demonized, but there's clearly someone, something wrong with this person. Can you help? I 
I had one Baptist pastor call me on a Friday night, and he goes, I've got this lady that, that she keeps having these prophetic dreams, and, uh, you know, I don't really do dreams, and I don't, I don't really know. i got a meeting with her at 10 in the morning. Can you interpret these dreams for me? So I did, and he had a great meeting. She thought he was wicked smart. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second is this. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. The ultimate value. Every decision that we make, every, every strategy that we long to implement flows through love. It must flow through and flow from love. A.W. Tozer said this. Now, love is both a principle and an emotion. Anyone who's married can attest to that a fact. There's moments where you are flooded with the emotion of love. When I was in my 20s, I thought I was invincible. I was mo way more brash than I am now. God bless fathers and faith that take people like me and soften my rough edges. I mean, some people think I'm a little rough now or a little bit edgy. I mean, I'm really, you don't, you don't know. And even you could talk to Deb about our first year of marriage. I mean, there was more iron sharpening iron in that one year of my life than, than any other year. Or all the other years, there's years of sharpening, softening. When the emotion's not there, you operate on principle. There's a spirit of burning and there's a spirit of truth. When you become less aware of the burning fire that's in your heart, you can still walk in principle. Why? Because that's what we do. Why did I come here this morning? Why? Because this is what I do. And not because this is my vocation. This is what I've done my entire adult life. Man, I'll tell you, let me be real. In my early 20s, there were times that I actually went to church drunk because that's what I did. It didn't matter what the circumstance of my life was in the moment. It didn't matter the pain. It didn't matter what was going on in my life. I'm just, I'm telling you because God had called me. And even though I made stupid decisions, I still went to church. You know, and, and you'll, you'll hear me say this periodically because I, I don't know why I get on social media because it annoys me so much, but you'll see people say, well, you don't have to go to church. I am the church. No, you're not. We are the church. And I'm not talking about the Bridge Metro West. I'm talking about the collective body. You cannot make a case for that in Scripture. It's deception. You are not the sole possessor of that which is called the temple of the Holy Spirit. We collectively, as a body, bring the expression of Jesus to the earth. And you cannot do that alone. You can get little snippets. You can get little pieces. His grace is enough. But I'm telling you, we're the body. That's how this thing works. So love. It's an emotion. It's a principle. I honor you guys for coming this morning. Some of you didn't really feel like being here when you walked in the door. It was completely evident when worship started. I almost got up and said, we're not the Bridge Metro West Funeral Home. That's not what we do. And I was in the prayer room. And I kind of felt like people were allowing presence to happen to them instead of releasing something to the presence. And there's a time and a space for that. It's just usually not when I'm around. Because I know this. I know that we come into his gates with thanksgiving in our heart and into his courts with praise, with a sound. And if we want to be a forerunner for what God is doing, we're going to have to release a sound. And when we don't feel like it, when the emotion's not there, we still operate out of the principle of love. And we release the sound because the sound you release when you don't feel like it will be the breakthrough for someone who can't quite get there. Can't tell you how many times I've seen that come to play. People will say, 
things to me like, you know, I mean, I was a worship leader for 20 years or so, and people would come, we would play, it would be the most awful worship set ever in the history of mankind. I'm a little dramatic, but that's how I would feel getting off the platform. People would be like, oh my gosh, I encountered angels, or, I, you know, God came, he, we, we saw physical healings in the midst of worship, nobody laying hands on anybody, people getting healed, people receiving Jesus. I remember one time a guy with heroin, heroin addiction got delivered in the midst of worship. Not because I was on my game. Not because I felt like doing what I had to do in that moment, but because I was willing to still be faithful out of the love that he gave me. God used me in my weakness to bring breakthrough for someone else. And it wasn't silent. It starts with the sound. Heaven is waiting for a sound. Be still and know that I am God. One time in scripture, we build an entire theology out of one scripture when the rest of scripture is beckoning us to get on the move. Calling us to get on the move. Begging us to release a sound. No, God doesn't beg. He commands but what, is, what, is, what do his commandments look like? When he speaks, he wants us to get inside the space of his voice because that's where his goodness flows. That's what obedience looks like. It's staying in the space of his voice and his name because that's where his goodness is, and we value his goodness above all else. When we step outside of his voice and his name, and then things start getting a little bit crazy, and, and we start making decisions that are outside the confines of the fruit of the Spirit or the testing of the spirits, and we, we all of a sudden we're spiraling out of control, and we're like, how do we get here? It's because we made a decision at one point in time to step outside of the voice and the name. That's what obedience is. It's simply to hear with comprehension. And God is banking on the idea that if you actually comprehend his voice, that's where you're going to want to be. Amen. Come on. Brax, I want to be a black preacher. Number two, family. We value family. And I'm talking about kingdom family. I, I value my family. But there's a value that Scripture puts on kingdom family. That your biological family fits into. Because we lay down the power of me for the glory of we. That's what unity looks like. Matthew 6 verse 9 says this. Pray then in this way. Our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. How does that prayer start? Whose father? Whose father? Is he your father? Is he my father? He's our father. So that indicates right out of the bat when the disciples are asking Jesus, how do we pray? And Jesus says, our father, that there's a collective nature of this kingdom family that we're being invited into. When I saw how many hands went up for salvation yesterday, I just simply said, welcome to the family. Doesn't mean that you'll always get along. Doesn't mean that you're going to like everybody in the room at all times or ever. Just means that we're family. And when your kids growing up in family together, you have disagreements, altercations, Maybe a few fights. I never did that. Right. <laughs> you know, it's always the sisters that keep me home. <laughs> oh, okay. Stay the course. Thousand points of light. It's a great funeral this week. A picture of honor. Our Father. Our Father. Let's make this a little bit more difficult to swallow. Because it's fun. Matthew 19, 29 says, write this down. Like, write this verse down. And you just got to sit with it. 
and figure out what this means and figure out what it doesn't mean. And everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or children or farms for my name's sake will receive many times as much and will inherit eternal life. What does that look like? That truly is between you and the Lord. But Jesus clearly puts an emphasis to allegiance to a household that is higher than mine. Worthy of note, the one familial relationship that he doesn't say for you to leave is spouse. Worthy of note. Well, I'm called to the mission field, but my husband, I mean, maybe my wife, I don't know. It doesn't mean that I don't, I don't leave home for periods of time. You all know that I travel. But I come back. <laughs> you know, God hasn't led me to places that are so grand that I, I want to stay. I, I, you, I, I, yeah. We've had that discussion. If you want to sleep on a dung floor hut, honey, come on. At least there's no snakes and spiders, mostly. So what do we do with that? Galatians 6, verse 10 says this. So, when, while, so then, while we have opportunity, and that's now, we have opportunity. Let us do good to all people. And especially, especially to those who are of the household of faith. See, our kingdom family takes precedence over the greater community that we call Metro West or Massachusetts or New England. And when we understand that we value this idea of kingdom family and above that we value love, it gives us a construct of how we can start making decisions of how, how we handle people and how we handle resources that are in our care to steward. We had someone come and, you know, they needed, they needed food for Thanksgiving and they, they went to Greta and, and they were asking for a referral to, to a place to turn, which is a, a food pantry that we support. That's a community food pantry. See, I don't have to have a Bridge Metro West food pantry because, you know, they've been doing it for 40 years. They already do it better than we can. So let's come under their vision, support it. But I loved what Greta's response was before I even got involved. She goes, you know what? Let's, let's talk about this because we take care of our own. So we don't need to outsource you to a community organization. And so we paid for the groceries. We've kept people's cars from being repossessed. We've paid rent. We've supplied heat. We've paid medical bills. We don't advertise those things because we protect the honor of the individuals, but there are people among you right now who are part of our kingdom family because we value you. If some, some person randomly calls on the phone and they say, hey, I need money, I've got to say, you know what, hey, why don't you come and you hang out and you come and be a part of family and we can get to know you. And then invariably they start yelling at you and telling you you don't know scripture. And I just sit there with a smile on my face. But see, we have a construct of values. It's not that we don't value the community. It's just that we value the household of, of faith, according to Galatians 6.10, at a higher level. A, do good to everyone, but especially of those of the household of faith. Does that make sense? Why is this important? Why do we need to take care of the internal? Because I, I like to think of us in a sense, I mean, it's not a perfect analogy, but we're importers and exporters of the kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. As we receive from heaven and we export the things of heaven in our life, we have to start at our base of operation to ensure that we're operating in the strength of our identity so that we have something effective to pour out to the community. 
Bill Johnson, I think he talks about this concept when he's talking about his own, his own family. You know, he, he's, he sort of comes at it, you know, ministry happens. Ministry happened to me. This whole Bethel thing happened to me. But when at the, at the end of the day, when I look in the mirror, I'm a father. Why was that so important to him? Because he realized that if, if he couldn't establish kingdom in his own household, then he had nothing to export to the greater family. Amen. So I'm a dad. In the natural, I'm a dad in the spirit. Sometimes I'm a good dad. Sometimes I'm not so great. Sometimes I provoke my son. The communities within our sphere of influence will know we are in Christ, not by our gifts, but by how we love each other as kingdom family. You know, when I started, I said the, the one thing that people will remark on when they come here is that they feel the presence. But when we actually, Jeremy actually searched all of the, the, the ratings we have, like on Google or on, on Facebook and all the various places where they can rate churches, which is weird, by the way. <laughs> you know, rate my church. Give me a five-star rating. But he said, here's the one thing that I saw across the board is that I came to this church and people were real. I, I try to be transparent. Number one, I like the shock value. Let's just be, I'm going to be completely honest. I love just giving you the nitty gritty of testimonies about my life that you don't actually want to hear. Because it amuses me. But there is a method to the madness. Because if you can look at me and you can say that, oh my gosh, God can work through him. And God can work through anybody. There's still, you know, every once in a while I'll run into somebody from my past, from my youth, from my college days, and they find out I'm a pastor, and they're like, what? I got to go to that church. We want to be real. Because if we don't get it right here, we won't have the proper gift and goodness of God to share out there. And we're getting it right. We're not perfect. We're, you, know, it, you know, some of you are all like, wow, we haven't really gotten it right. And the reality is you're the problem. Part of it. I'll take the other part of the blame. I'm the problem. I've, oh, I've been a problem for a long time. It's okay. I'm a problem for the devil. Number three, Community. Supreme value is love. Number two is family, but we also value community. We know that we're called to disciple nations. Where does it start? It starts in our own community. You know, 10 years ago, man, we had great times in the Holy Spirit. We still do. We saw signs and wonders, man. We, we saw gold dust, man. I would get gold dust on my keyboard. I know that might be freaky for some of you, but I'm just being real. So you got to look at me and say I'm either crazy or I'm telling the truth. I don't know why. I don't know how that happened. I didn't tell anybody about it because I didn't want crazy Christians coming up and like with scotch tape trying to steal all the gold dust off of my keyboard. But God would just manifest. We had a glory cloud. Or we'll, we'll just call it a cloud. You can call it whatever you want. A cloud manifested in the room during worship. I thought I was having a vision experience because I was so tired because I'd done all night worship the night before and done the morning session and I did that. was doing the night session. I'm leading worship and I'm thinking about cheeseburgers. I'm just being really honest with you. I was not in the flow of the Spirit. I was in the flow of bacon cheeseburgers with mayonnaise and ketchup. And out of the corner of my eye, I started to see this cloud form. And I thought, man, I'm so tired. Like, I'm, I'm seeing things. But I was like, I'm having a vision experience or whatever, an impression. I have an impression that the glory is here. It's great. And I, I know I, I wasn't really paying attention to what people were doing. But about an hour later, there was like two or three rows of people just pressed up in the front. And they were all looking up. And I went, oh, they all see it. We had amazing times. We saw healings and, and just stuff happen. But see, nobody in Natick and Framingham knew who we were. 
We had maybe one family from Framingham, one fr family from Natick, one household that, that came, but we're called the Bridge Metro West, but nobody in Metro West knew who we were. A lot of people drove 45 minutes. We had people drive from Vermont to come down to our services, but we weren't impacting our community. If we ceased to exist in that moment, there were church people that would have been sad. But Natick and Framingham, they wouldn't have known the difference. And so I knew that we had to make a, a shift. We had to make a change. And so we value the community. We recognize that we're here to bring discipleship. We're bring, to bring love and joy and peace, to bring the, the essence of the kingdom inside the community so it brings them to a point of decision. And so we go to places like a place to turn. And we regularly serve them. They've been in existence, I, I don't know, I mean, I say 40 years. It's been over 30 years for sure. And we go to places like a Natick, Natick Service Council. We're, we're beginning to foster relationships with SMOC. It's a huge organization. We've had two meetings with SMOC. And we're just beginning to foster relationship, not in a way that we can say, oh, we want to outsource people to you, but we come to them and say, we want to be part of the solution. What are your problems? Tell us. And what, what's your love language? I know what your love language is. It's people and it's money. So we're going to send you people, and we're going to send you finances, and we're going to be part of the solution. We're going to lay down our lives to grab the hands of people that can't get themselves out of a pit. And we're going to teach them and show them this thing called hope that they could actually be more than who they are in the moment. That's what we do as community. Matthew 28, 18 through 20 says this. And Jesus came up and spoke to them saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Game over. But verse 19, it gets better. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. It starts to become a little reminiscent of that Psalm 23 passage. Oh, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Just got King James on you. But here's the issue. What is the attitude that you have towards your community or even towards your nation? What are the things that you say about your community and about your nation? What are the things that you say about your workplace and your co-workers? What are you as a prophet or prophetess of God who is harboring Jesus Christ, the hope of the revelation of glory? What is the sound that you're emitting in the places where you go? Jeremiah 29 7 gives us insight as to what our heart condition will be. He says, Seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you into exile. How many of you feel like you're in exile in your workplace? And pray to the Lord on its behalf, for in its welfare you will have welfare. We had someone who attended the church for a number of years. They were the first time they came. Their first time family, we call them. Walked in the door. They were a little terrified. I see y'all, if you're a first time visitor, that kind of uneasy look you get when you see the ladies dancing and prancing and perhaps some flags and fabric flowing. And hey, at least you haven't been hit in the head with a flag. And someone got up and they spoke a prophetic word over that individual and just lit them up. And they became family. They were here for, for a while. And there came a point in time we were having a conversation in the back and they just started saying, I just hate Massachusetts. I just want to get out of here. And I looked at them so they can go. Because the kingdom doesn't need your disdain to bring transformation to this land. Right. Turns out they moved. I was fine with that. Because Jeremiah 29, 7 says, Seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you into exile. You're not in exile. Knock it off. 
I mean, I was about to say something bad, but I won't. Irrespective of our feelings about our towns, our state, and our nation, we seek the welfare of the place where we have been sent for such a time as this. God bless America, land that I love. And generosity of spirit, we connect with love. We disciple in love, and we transform by love. It's the supreme value. And we demonstrate to the community who Jesus Christ is by how we love each other in the kingdom. It's not about building our kingdom. It's about establishing his. It's about coming into the agreement with the prayer of Jesus. Kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. He wasn't asking the father to do something. He was coming into agreement with what the father was already doing in that moment. It's a declaration. It's not begging. And Proverbs 11, 11 says, By the blessing of the upright, a city is exalted. Have you blessed your city today? Have you blessed your town today? Have you blessed your workplace today? Have you blessed your community today? There's power in the sound of your voice. I'm not talking about silent prayer. The angels that the Lord has assigned to your life, they're waiting for a sound to come out of your mouth so that they can cooperate with what God is doing in your heart. And if you don't feel it in your heart, then you operate out of principle. Because love is a principle and an emotion. When the emotion is lacking, you can still speak blessing over your city. You can still be, speak blessing over your school. You can still speak blessing over your workplace because you, this is what we do. You could speak blessing over your family. There's power, the power of life and death are in your tongue. That's not a metaphor. It's a reality. God can read your mind and your heart, but heaven doesn't. The angels don't. They can read your face really, really well, but they're waiting for the sound. They're waiting to cooperate with a sound. Frozen, chosen, no more. We're not a silent church. If Jesus is the lion of the tribe of Judah and we are therefore Christ's ambassadors, we better start roaring. I mean, you know. I say that with a little fear and trembling. Number four, excellence. We're coming in for a landing. We value excellence. You know, and I think this value is maybe a knee-jerk reaction to some things that, that some of us experienced in our youth. I remember having to sing a, a duet with another dude at a men's conference. And it was really bad. And I was like, hey, man, we need to rehearse, like, more. And he kept saying, no, we don't need, it's just the anointing that matters. Well, it's, the anointing matters to you, but let me tell you, the excellence will matter to them when we get up there and we start singing out of key. I mean, we're called to make a joyful noise. I've heard some of your joyful noises, and I love it. I, I truly do. I want you to make a, a joyful noise, but it doesn't mean I'm going to give you the microphone. <laughs> The anointing does matter. But we need to do what we do as unto the Lord. The fruit of our ranked values of love, family, and community will be expressed in our final value of excellence. Hebrews 10.24 says, Let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds. Other transla translations describe it as provoking one another. I like that word, provoke. <laughs> Stimulate's kind of a weird word anyway, but, but I'll provoke you. And I've been provoked, but I really like to be the provoker. 
to good deeds. What is what is good deeds? What does a good deed look like? It means that we're mirroring the excellence of God as he came down into creation in Genesis 1 and he began to speak things that were not as though they were. And when he spoke the word, he said, oh, that's good. And then he created first man. He created first woman. He said, oh, that's very good. And so what is the word saying? I mean, this is a book that is to the Hebrews. In a New Testament, in a New Covenant context, it says provoke each other to good deeds. That means to step out and start to speak things that are not as though they are. Start to operate in faith. Start to get your feet and your hands a little bit dirty in the things of the earth until the ground, until the soil, until new life begins to spring up on your left and on your right. And everywhere you go, as you declare that the kingdom of heaven is at hand, you will see the new life, the new, the goodness of God in the land of the living. And that's really flowery and really prophetic -y and a little bit abstract, but sometimes it looks like giving someone a meal. Sometimes it looks like stopping for the one. Sometimes it looks like honoring someone else with a gift no strings attached so when we give we give up authority of that which is in our hands and we place it into the hands of another I don't need to worry about what they're going to do with it when I give money to someone on the street I don't, I don't worry about whether or not they're going to go buy drugs with it I listen to the Lord I mean, I don't want you to give the, the, the wrong idea. Like, I'm not just, you know, Mr. Moneybags, and I'm just handing money out everywhere. But I also know that the Word says that some of us have entertained angels unaware. And so usually when a circumstance comes and interrupts my convenience, first off, I get cranky. But second off, I begin to think, is this an angel? Is this a test? Because God wants us wants to interrupt our system, our convenience, our time. You know, I, I think in America we have two idols right now. We've got money and we've got time. And we worship those things over the king who created them. Money is a tool of the kingdom. It's a method of service. Time is a tool of the kingdom. It's a method, it's a construct in which we serve. But you're the master of neither. So we pursue excellence, not out of obligation, but out of a generosity of spirit that is willing to sow our time in order to reap something greater. We pursue excellence to properly represent the excellence of God rather than purchase the favor of man. We provoke each other to excellence in order to corporately realize our greatest potential and the destiny God has for us. What is the end result? This is the end result of our vision and mission statement. A people communities, cities, regions, nations will enjoy and reflect the fruit of the Spirit beginning with love, joy, and peace because we have shown them Jesus. This is your time. This is our time as the Bridge Metro West. We've never felt more that we're in an about-to moment. And I don't, I don't step into those kind of weird, you know, prophetic -y kind of, because I, you know, at the, every December I could say God is about to. You know, prophetic bulletins will be flooded with God is about to. It's a new season. It's a, you know, biblically seasons were usually 40 to 400 years. And America seasons are like four weeks. I'm just in a new season, brother. You're in the same season. Be faithful. Just be faithful. Be excellent. This is our time. And this is our mission. We will disciple people. 
We will disciple communities and we will disciple nations. Dream with God again and watch what we do. There is greatness in this room. Every age level, there is greatness in this room. You know, I said recently, I mean, someone came up to me after service and, and uh, I, you know, this happens periodically because I, I talk. And let me tell you, when, when I first started this journey as the senior leader back in 2011, I remember saying this, I will hurt you and you will hurt me because that's what families do. But I had said something that was hurtful and and they were in pain, but it would, you know, and I realized that, you know, maybe one of my weaknesses sometimes is that I, it's hard for me to be present in the moment of your pain, you know, particularly if it's, you know, maybe something a little bit that's going to be more, a, a much more momentary affliction. Although, I mean, I'm with you for the long haul, so if I'm the affliction for you, then, uh, you know. <laughs> But I, I just couldn't see them in that moment because I, don't, I didn't see that person as they were. I saw them at their greatest potential rising up over the momentary, momentary difficulty of navigating some maybe some ill-conceived words. I somewhat saw someone who was fire-breathing and full of life, full of joy. Someone that was leading people to Jesus in droves and casting out demons with the joy that it was in her heart because the joy is her strength. And sometimes it's hard for me to be present with you in, in a moment because I'm already seeing you at your greatest potential. And when I look out at this room, I don't see someone who's depressed. I don't see someone who's caught up in anxiety. I don't see someone who's in a difficult marriage. I see sons and daughters of the King, sons and daughters and little siblings of Jesus, who's the firstborn of the dead, breathing the fire and the glory of God and bringing the kingdom across New England, across the nation and around the world. There's greatness in this room. So dream with God. Now I'll, I'll try to be better at being present in the moment. Imagine living with me. My son's trying to navigate being 12 and I already see him at 80. That's not true. 55. Our mission is to leave the imprint of the Father's heart on every person we meet. Encounter. Our mission is to demonstrate the love of Jesus, the power of Holy Spirit, and to leave the imprint of the Father's heart on everyone we meet until people, communities, cities, regions, and nations enjoy and reflect the fruit of the Spirit beginning with love, joy, and peace. There's so much gifting in this room. So much calling in this room. There's so much anointing available in this room right now. You have no idea. You got a hint maybe, but you got no idea. Some of you are in the darkest time of your life today, and I'm looking at you, and I feel giddy inside because I know where you're headed. And some of you think you've already arrived, but the Lord's saying, are you will, really willing to pay the price, count the cost? Salvation is free, but overcoming is an option. Comes with fire, comes with testing. Are you willing to bear your cross in order to fulfill your greatest potential in Christ Jesus for his glory and his kingdom? What do I see? I see current and future leaders. I see gifted teachers of the word instilling biblical structure and values in baby Christians. I see pastors, prophets, evangelists, even apostles, not necessarily by vocation, but by gifting, impacting their spheres of influence and leading people to Jesus and discipling them into maturity. 
I see God developing leaders who will impact local, state, and even national legislation. I see God developing leaders who will speak into executive branches of government. I see innovation and transformation coming to healthcare as well as mental and spiritual healthcare. I see a church functioning in excellence through love that will be known by the cities, the towns, the agencies from Boston to Worcester and beyond as a company of people who is to serve existing vision and provide solutions for societal problems at every level. This is the church of the 21st century. Let's stand together. It's time to dream again. It's time to dream again. Some of you are dreaming for the very first time. God, could it be me? Could it be me? Many are called, but few are chosen. God, I pray, I ask, and I declare that this company of people that we call the Bridge Metro West will be chosen ones. We will bear the cross that you give us for the joy set before us, just like Jesus did. We're going to be communicating about this pretty intensely over the next couple weeks, but in January, we're, we're going to hold a dream night. We're going to come together and we're going to worship and pray and corporately seek God as a body. My, my heart, I, I really want to figure out, you know, a way to do child care so parents can come. And you can kind of be free of the encumberment. It's not an encumberment. Kids are a blessing. We know that. But you know what I mean. Because when I'm looking out and I'm seeing young families and I'm seeing parents, and I, I, I see... I see you beyond what you feel your strength is right now. And God is speaking. He's, he's breathing dreams right now in this season. And so we're going to come together and we're going to give ourselves permission to dream outlandishly with God. Because He can do above and beyond anything that we could ever ask or think. So I don't know exactly what that's going to look like, but, but we're just committing to it right now. We just had a release of the Spirit, and, and it, was, it was Maybell that, I think, that wrote us and said, I feel like we got to have a dream night. So we're going to dream with God. What have I been dreaming about, man? I've been dreaming of, about buildings. And faith is rising. It's time to go, guys. It's time to go. I got a call from someone and said, hey, do you want to plant a church right now? And I said, not, not quite yet, because God is on the move and he's, he's building us. He's already provided for us a new base of operation from which we can fan out across the region and the globe. 100,000 people within a five mile radius. I love the Bob Jones prophecy about a billion soul harvest, but at the time that was one seventh of the world's population. So one seventh of that 100,000 within this five mile radius, that's our responsibility. Someone came up to me, they're like, well, I, you know, what about all the other churches? They're, the other churches are not my responsibility. This region is. So I, mean, I hope, man, let's all race to that 12,287 or whatever that number is, which is one-seventh of 100,000. Man, and I hope somebody else gets there before us, but that's where we're going. We're making disciples. Even in this room right now, we're discipling nations in this room. But you got to believe that we can get beyond where we are, that we can individually and corporately operate at our greatest potential in Christ Jesus. The supreme value is love. Everything we do is because we love. When we say, when we say oh, God just calling us to, to be a small church, what we're actually saying is we don't love the community enough to invite them in and grow. 
There are people dying right now to receive that Christ in you, the hope of glory. It's, it's time to start telling them. It's time to, to be proud that you're a daughter of the king. It's time to be proud that you're a prince of royalty. It's time to realize that you have the upper hand. The world may come against you and they may bring persecution and, and, and they may speak against the ideals that we hold dear, but we have the upper hand. The victory has already been won. It's, it's time to stand on the promises of God and open your heart, not only to him, but to those around you and to speak life, to speak life and just even to say, hey, I know this place. I know this place and Natick, Massachusetts, where you can come and you can encounter the living God. You don't believe me? Man, we had an atheist show up yesterday and he said, I don't know what just happened, but I encountered him. I encountered him. I used to make fun of you people, but now I think I am one of you people. Because we value encounter. We value love. Holy Spirit, come. I know that you're here, but you delight in invitations. So we just give you an invitation right now to just come. Even right now, breathe on hearts and minds. Breathe possibility. Now, I know I went over time again, and, and I know the teachers are waiting to release the kids, but just, just stand with him for just a moment. Where there is depression, I speak joy. Where there is anxiety, I speak peace, Lord. Where there is sickness, I speak life, God. Where there is hopelessness, we release the assurance of the glory of God. All around this room, awaken to life. Awaken to life. Awaken and dream with God again. We're not just marking time. We're not just here for an ordinary Sunday morning gathering. We're here to encounter the face and the heart of Jesus who longs to lead us to the Father so that we can experience that same unity with the Father that he's experienced for all eternity. Oh, Holy Spirit, come. I want to call the ministry team up very quickly. Come up. I know we didn't pray for healing during worship today, but I, I, if you're here and you need physical healing, we want to pray with you. If you're here and you you know that you're just not in Jesus right now, maybe you've known about him, you've known this idea of religion, but you've not really stepped in, I want you to come forward. If you're here and you just need some prayer, some breakthrough in your heart and your mind to be able to dream again, to allow hope to rise up in your heart again, let me tell you, for some of you, you need to hear these words, this too shall pass. This is a momentary affliction. This is not the reality of your destiny. This is a test. It's a moment. And he's given you everything you need to stand and rise up out of the muck and the mire of your life right now. Perfect love has come and is displacing, eradicating, and casting out every spirit of fear and trepidation off of your life. He's not given you a spirit of timidity, but of love, of power, and discipline. So God, I ask right now that you would release your angelic all around this room, those flaming swords of fire, and strike us deep in the heart, bringing identity, bringing kingdom reality, bringing physical healing, emotional healing, bringing transformation, glory to glory moment, salvation, healing, deliverance inside the sacred space of the name Jesus. Jesus. Just lift your voice right now. Give him thanks right now. Oh, we thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. 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 Come on, just release the sound. Release the sound. Oh, go above and beyond what you think is normal in this moment. Go above and beyond what you think is even maybe appropriate in this moment. Release that sound. The roar of the kingdom is inside of you. up the altars. Come and, and receive healing. Come and allow Holy Spirit to rock you. A fresh baptism of fire. A fresh baptism 
of love. We've got Elijah House. You can sign up for that. Man, we want to connect you with destiny. We want to just disconnect you from the wounds of your history and place you lovingly into destiny. That's what Elijah House does. You can sign up for that in the corner, and we're going to rock you with prayer. Bless you guys. Bless you guys. This is your time, and this is our time. In Jesus' name, amen.
Namaste.